In my opinion, Jane Seymour is one of the most overlooked of Henry VIII's six queens. So it was very important to me, since I have been researching her brother for many years, to try to get the story of the real Jane out there. And that's what we're going to do today. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's all totally free with no catch. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. You're listening to the Tudor's Dynasty podcast with Rebecca Larson. Hello and welcome back. As we are still preparing for the new season to start in September, we're doing some flashback episodes. And today we're going to flash back to the episode about Jane Seymour with Dr. Elizabeth Norton. Now, Jane Seymour has always been the queen of Henry VIII who seems to be overlooked. People think she's meek and she's mild. Some think she's a homewrecker. There's a long list of descriptive terms that could be used for Jane Seymour. But I wanted Dr. Norton to return to the show to tell us the things that maybe we didn't know about her. Maybe let's bust some myths. Let's learn about her childhood. Let's learn about the real Jane Seymour from the research that she's done. So today I am so pleased to air for you again my interview with Dr. Elizabeth Norton on Jane Seymour. But before we get to that interview, I have to tell you about the Wolf Hall weekend that is coming up next summer in Devon, England. You guys do not want to miss out on this amazing event. It is to honor Hilary Mantle, Dame Hilary Mantle, who wrote the Wolf Hall trilogy. So there's our connection to Jane Seymour. Come check out the links in the bio. There is a lot of information there about who the presenters are going to be. There are going to be great historians there. There are going to be some actors there, some really fascinating people who will have some great things to say, not only about Tudor history, but also Hilary Mantle and her writing. So find the links in the show notes to find out some more information about this event. And maybe, just maybe, I'll see you in Devon, England next summer. Elizabeth, welcome back. Thank you very much for inviting me back. It's such a pleasure. I'm so excited because today we're going to talk about a queen who has become one of my favorites over time, Jane Seymour. And you wrote a biography about her. When did you write that again? Uh, it was back in 2009, I think. So it's it's a, a long time ago. And really, there hadn't been much written on her before that. So it was quite kind of going into new territory. And I think when I started my research on Thomas Seymour, I, you know, because there wasn't much written about him at that time, I believe I started reading the books on Jane to kind of get an idea of the family. And yours was actually one of the first ones I ever read. So you did such a great job on the research and writing of that book. I highly recommend that if anybody is interested in learning about Jane to read Elizabeth's book, because as you will learn today, she knows a lot about Jane. Well, that's very kind of you. <laughs> well, let's start from the beginning then with Jane. You know, we know that her family was country gentry. Can you explain what that means exactly? Yeah, so the gentry are, they're an enormous class in Tudor England. They are one step below the nobility. So they're not lords, they're not earls, they're not dukes. Um, some of them have titles, so some of them are knights. So, you know, for example, Sir John Seymour, Jane Seymour's father, he is a knight. But you also get esquires and just gentlemen, people who are able to describe themselves as a gentleman. In many countries, they would be kind of the lower rank of the no nobility. And it's just really in England, there aren't that many titled families. So they are very much not peasants. They're not lower class people, but they're at the lowest rung of people who can attend court, who can receive a visit from the king. Now, one of the things about Jane is that she actually had some royal blood through her mother's side of the family. Can you elaborate on that? 
Yeah, she did. So, um, I mean, all of Henry VIII's wives are descended from the Plantagenet kings. Jane is descended from Edward III. So he is a king in the 14th century, had a lot of children and a lot of descendants. And because the Tudor court is actually quite a small world and everyone is interrelated, Jane, yet yeah, very much does have royal blood. And her mother was higher ranking than her father. Now, let's look at her childhood just a little bit. Now, I know there really isn't that much known about her childhood or even Thomas's, but can you tell us maybe a little about what you learned about her life at Wolf Hall? Yeah, so a lot of it is kind of reconstruction and thinking about, you know, what a girl of her class would, what her life would be like. But we can get a sense of what life was like at Wolf Hall. So... The manor house, it's not enormous. Um, There's probably about 50 people in the household, so family and then servants as well. And in this period, servants live quite intermingled lives with their social superiors. So, you know, you can expect unmarried serving maids to be sharing rooms with the daughters of the household, potentially. We can assume that Jane's mother plays a major role in her early education. That would be quite usual. So the mother, until the children are old enough to have tutors, will teach them their letters, will teach them to read. Sometimes the parish priest is also involved. So we can assume that Jane's mother, Marjorie, is involved and that Jane will be taught with her siblings who are close in age. So not Edward, because he is considerably older than Jane, but certainly Thomas, and also their their other sisters as well. It's a rural life. Um, They have gardens, they have orchards, they have farmland. Jane will be taught needlework. That's a really important part of a young gentlewoman's upbringing. Her mother will certainly ensure that she can sew, that she can make clothing, and that she can do more decorative embroideries. She'll be taught music. She'll be taught dancing, because these are really important skills for a gentlewoman. Her education doesn't appear to be particularly extensive. She can certainly read and write. Um, Most women of her class could, of her generation. She'll probably be taught a little arithmetic. She probably knows some French. Um, She can certainly talk to Eustace Chapuis as queen in French to a certain extent, although, I mean, it's not a particularly involved conversation. She probably doesn't know any Latin. I'm interested by that because I think I was always under the impression that she could not speak any foreign language, that she wasn't taught them. Yeah, well, we know that she has this... So it's always with Jane. It's so tantalizing. You just don't... We just don't have the information on Jane that we have for others of Henry's wives, but we just have kind of clues and hints. So, for example, early in her queen's chip, um, Eustace Chapuis, who's the imperial ambassador, sort of takes her aside and speaks to her. And she seems to have been quite out of her depth with this conversation because Henry comes over and rescues her after a few minutes and then takes over. But Chapuis would have been speaking French to Jane, definitely. And so um, I think we can, you know, he doesn't say, you know, and the Queen couldn't understand a word I said. So I think we can kind of guess that there's a little bit of French there, but she's certainly not fluent. Okay. Now, you mentioned a little bit about um, her mother, Marjorie. Do we have any ideas? Is there any evidence to let us know what kind of relationship Jane had with her? So, again, I mean, it's it's sort of guesswork, unfortunately. Marjorie is higher born than Jane's father. She was actually raised in the household of her aunt, the Countess of Surrey, up at Sheriff Hutton Castle. What's quite interesting about that is the Countess of Surrey is the mother of Anne Boleyn's mother. So the two cousins are raised together, Marjorie, Jane Seymour's mother, and Anne Boleyn's mother. She is reported by John Skelton, the poet, to have been benign, courteous, and meek, which I think we can see carried through into how her daughter portrayed herself. So, I mean, we can assume that they're, they're reasonably close, but equally there's no evidence that Marjorie comes to court with Jane when she's queen. And she seems to have remained in the country when she dies during Edward VI's reign. And bearing in mind that Marjorie is Edward VI's grandmother, actually her death causes very little stir. They don't even put the court into mourning, which suggests that she presumably had a relatively close relationship with her mother, at least in childhood. But um, her mother doesn't come to court as a supporter. I feel like Marjorie Seymour is one of those elusive characters from history where we want to know so much about her and where she was. And yet there really isn't anything to give us a play by play for her. And that's so frustrating. 
Absolutely. And it's it's just really frustrating because it would be great to know what she's thinking because her daughter becomes queen. Right. Her grandson becomes king. Um, her son is Lord Protector. Another is Lord Admiral. You know, I, I'd love to know what she's thinking, but actually um, we've just, we've got nothing apart from really the fact that she's benign, courteous and meek, according <laughs> to John Skelton, who did know her in her youth. That's all we have. Now, you mentioned that Edward was much older than Jane, and we know that there were 10 Seymour children. And I've always been under the impression that Jane was younger than Thomas, but that she was the eldest daughter. From the research that you've done over the years, what evidence did you find that confirmed an order? Or were you even able to find any evidence that confirmed an order of the children? So again, I mean, nobody, I mean, they're born before you get um, parish records, which would note baptism. So again, we're kind of trying to order the children. Edward is definitely considerably older. He's the second son. The eldest son is John, who dies as a teenager and has a memorial brass in Great Bedouin Parish Church, which is close to Wolf Hall. There are some children lost in infancy, which um, sort of leaves a gap in the family. And then you've got the younger group of children. You've got Henry Seymour is younger than Edward. He is the brother that doesn't come to court effectively and stays in the countryside. And then we've got a gap and we've got probably Thomas before Jane, looking at the facts of their lives and when Thomas comes to court. You then have Jane quite close in age. I mean, I would suggest she's probably about a year or so. And partly that's based on the fact that 29 ladies walked in her funeral procession, which possibly suggest she was 29 years old it's a slightly random number otherwise and that's a sort of you know that's the sort of symbolism that was often carried out so I think she's probably born in around 1508 but again it, it's supposition to some extent and she's the eldest sister the eldest daughter so she has two younger sisters I want to talk a little bit about Jane and her sister Elizabeth because I do remember reading that Jane had a possible marriage arrangements before she wed Henry VIII, but her sister Elizabeth ended up getting married before her, didn't she? Yes, yes, she did, which is really quite unusual. You would tend to marry off the eldest daughter first. And that sort of fits with the view and the idea we have of Jane from her early life that actually she wasn't particularly special if you like um you know she's she didn't really stand out um she's quite sort of pale and sort of mousy you know I mean even in the period pale skin is very very fashionable but actually Jane is seen as so pale by some commentators that actually she's not attractive she doesn't have much of a dowry you know she's not going to inherit anything she's got three surviving brothers she's got no chance of the Seymour estates so actually she doesn't seem to have been much of a catch there is only one man whose name is mentioned with her before Henry VIII, and that is William Dormer. And that was a marriage that was suggested by Sir Francis Bryan. He's the infamous vicar of hell, so he's a bit of a notorious character, but very close to the king and very influential. And he seems to have taken Jane under his wing a bit. He's a distant cousin of hers. They're related again through the Countess of Surrey. And he attempts to marry her off to William Dormer, possibly because actually her parents hadn't been successful. And according to Dormer's daughter, Jane, um, and there's a, a biography of her life, um, actually her grandmother was horrified at the thought of this marriage between her son and this dowerless girl, Jane Seymour, and hurriedly marries her, his, her son off to a more suitable suitor. So um, Jane is clearly not seen as a real catch on the marriage market. Now, Jane Dormer says that this was that the, the betrothal was really broken because of Francis Bryan. The Dormers didn't want to be allied to Francis Bryan, but you can't help but get the sense that actually, you know, Jane just wasn't prestigious enough. Now, moving forward a little bit to um, Jane joining the household of Catherine of Aragon, one of the things um, that I think I, I learned recently was that most women of Jane's standing did not join a queen's household before serving in a lesser household. Do we know what path Jane took? So again, unfortunately, it's supposition. Leaving home in your early teens, so when you're around 13 or 14, is really, really common in Tudor England for men and women of all social classes, apart from really from top royalty. Um, it's it's almost a life stage. It's that common. If you're 
lower status, you go into service. So you need to go and work in a household or on a farm. If you're a higher status girl like Jane, you go to live with a hopefully higher ranking gentlewoman or noblewoman. And you, you kind of provide some service, carrying messages, um, you know, waiting on the table a little bit. But in general, you're there for companionship. And also the hope is that you'll then have access to better marriage partners. But yeah, it's absolutely right. It's There aren't that many places in the Queen's household. So most Tudor gentlewomen and noblewomen will do a period of service in another household, a slightly lower ranking household, with the hope that they'll be able to move up to the Queen. And unfortunately with Jane, we just don't have this information. We actually don't have any source that actually places her in Catherine of Aragon's household at all. We just have, it's always been traditionally said that she served Catherine and she certainly seems to have had an affinity with Princess Mary. She seems to have known Princess Mary from before her marriage, which suggests that she was in Catherine's household. But again, we just don't know. Thank you for clarifying that, because I think many of us just assumed that there is evidence that places her in that household. And I'm, I'm glad you clarified that for us as well. Yeah, no, I wish there was. I wish there was. I I think it's very likely um, because of her relationship with Mary, Princess Mary. But yeah, we've got nothing. It's It's definitely up to debate. This brief interruption is brought to you by, well, me. Do you love Tudor's Dynasty? Consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Patrons get access to all kinds of amazing things that the everyday listener does not. Find out more by going to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty, and click Become a Patron for details. All right, back to the show. Jane is one of those characters from history where I feel like people want to understand who she was and how she thought. What is your take on Jane's personality? So Jane is so interesting because, again, I mean, we've got no personal letters written by her at all. We only have formal letters as queen. So, you know, you know, the queen announces the birth of Prince Edward, for example. Nothing, nothing that shows us what's going on inside her head. We've only got one recorded instance of her actual speech. So she's a bit of an enigma. She certainly portrayed herself as a meek, mild sort of, obedient young woman. That's certainly her image. Um, she wears the English gable hood, which is shaped like the roof of the house and is is quite unflattering, um, certainly compared to the French hood, which Anne Boleyn, of course, wears and which shows an, a daring amount of hair. So Jane very much is portrayed and portrays herself as meek, mild, doesn't have a lot to say, perhaps not a lot going on in her head. Um, I don't buy that. I have to say, I'm um, looking at the facts of Jane's life. Um, she certainly pursues Henry VIII as determinedly as Anne Boleyn does, I would argue. Um, certainly she plays her cards very, very well because, of course, she is the woman that brings down Anne Boleyn, if you like. She persuades Henry to end his marriage to Anne Boleyn. And when you think of the relationship, Anne Boleyn is very much Henry VIII's great passion. Um, so for Jane to do that really does suggest that there is a lot more going on in her head. So I would personally argue that, you know, there is steel underneath this mousy exterior. And she's very much presenting herself as an opposite to Anne Boleyn. But th this isn't really the real Jane because she plays her hand so well. And what we can see of her activity, she is quite determined and she does have opinions. She wants Henry to bring Princess Mary back to court. She is involved in trying to save at least one nunnery. Um, she certainly has an opinion on the Pilgrimage of Grace, which is a rebellion against Henry VIII's changes to the church. Um, she actually says to Henry that she thinks it's God's judgment on him for ruining so many churches. And actually, I think in many ways, if she had lived, we would see a much more outspoken Jane, a much more vivid Jane. I think she spends a lot of her queenship very, very frightened because Henry has, of course, executed her predecessor. And he does remind her of what he did to Anne Boleyn when she displeases him. So when Jane displeases him during her marriage. So I think she spent a lot of her time actually quite scared and keeping her head down, if you like. I think I'm with you on Jane's personality. Over the years, I've I've kind of changed my opinion on her, and I see her more now as much more similar maybe to Thomas, 
as in the fact that she was willing to kind of scheme and think about how she wanted things to play out. Although in the end, I think she was smarter than Thomas was (laughs) and that she would have been more patient for the things that she wanted. Yeah, no, I would agree with you there. I mean, I think they are quite similar. And of course, Jane and Thomas, they're probably only about a year apart in age. They're They must have been close in childhood. She's certainly going to be closer to Thomas than she is to Edward. And I think they do share this ambition, this desire for power. And, you know, I think Jane was probably quite surprised by Henry's interest in her. But when when she noticed it, she very much grasps it and she plays she plays the game very, very well. And I think a lot of people want to understand and know what Jane's feelings toward Henry VIII were, but we don't really know, do we? No, again, um, yeah, I'm sorry I'm saying this so often, but it's, it really is a testament to just how obscure Jane is, which is such a shame. No, we don't know her, her feelings for Henry at all. I mean, he's obviously very attracted to her. I think she presents an opposite to Anne Boleyn. Anne was very fiery. She made a good mistress, but not necessarily a good queen as far as Henry was concerned. So I think Jane Seymour is very much a reversion back to Catherine of Aragon, but younger and more fertile, at least Henry is hoping. But no, we don't know her feelings for Henry. I think she must have been frightened. Um, You know, I said that earlier, but I think she probably didn't know what sort of man she was marrying entirely until the 19th of May when he beheads Anne Boleyn because suddenly he's a man that has killed his wife. And Jane, of course, knows that the charges are trumped up. And, um, you know, she'd been in the Queen's household. She knows that Anne Boleyn can't have been by herself with these men. She just didn't have the time and space to commit adultery. So if he can do that to Anne Boleyn, Jane, of course, knows that he can do that to her. And he keeps postponing her coronation. There are rumours that it's postponed to see whether she can become pregnant. And Jane doesn't become pregnant for a really long time. Um, You know, she's been married sort of around eight months, really, before she becomes pregnant. And that's quite a long time for a king who needs a son. So she must have been worried that Henry would find trumped up charges against her. So I suspect her her overwhelming um, feeling for Henry is actually that he's quite terrifying in many respects, which is really, really sad. You mentioned how maybe, you know, at the beginning, Jane was in this situation where Henry wanted to marry her and she didn't know what she was getting into. And I kind of see a similarity between Jane and Catherine Parr, where Catherine Parr decides this was God's will. I wonder if that's how Jane felt, too. This is the will of God and I'm going to go along with it and I'm going to be queen because of it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's quite likely. And I think as well, um, she may well have assumed that Anne Boleyn would be sent away to a nunnery. Anne Boleyn certainly expected to be sent to a nunnery because that would end the marriage. So, you know, for Jane, this is, you know, she's heading towards spinsterhood. Absolutely. She has no fiancé. There's no prospect of anyone wanting to marry her. She's in her mid-20s. She's not, you know, she's staying on the shelf, if you like. So suddenly to have the king's interest, it must have been flattering. And I can see why she grasped it with both hands. But I I do think that the execution of Anne Boleyn is, is likely to have been a fundamental moment in Jane's life where she thinks maybe this wasn't a great decision, possibly. I'm going to backtrack just a little bit to Jane's time in Anne Boleyn's household. And I want to know, did Anne Boleyn really tear the locket from Jane's neck? Yeah, they do seem to have fought. Um, There are a a couple of records of them, of many scratchings and blows between them. Um, And yeah, uh, there is a source that says that she was wearing Henry's picture quite boldly and and snatches it off so hard that she hurt her hand. And we know that Henry did like to give his picture to the women that he was interested in. It's, you know, his sort of way of saying, you know, you can look at me even when we're not together and to try and get get their interest going. So I think it's quite likely. Um, they certainly fought in the household. It must have been very, very uncomfortable. And it shows Jane's growing ascendancy compared to Anne, that actually Anne has to put up with the woman that her husband is pursuing in her household. And we see that earlier in the marriage. Anne Boleyn was unable to get Henry's mistresses sent away. Now, I'm not normally one for the what-ifs of history. I just, I have a hard time with it. But... Let's say had Jane lived and she survived into Edward VI's reign, 
Do you think, because of her still being alive, that Edward and Thomas would have been saved from execution? Yeah, I think it's pretty likely. Um, And again, that's sort of another tragedy. If Jane had survived childbirth, she was entirely safe in Henry's affections. He might have had mistresses. He, you know, might have got off her a bit, but he was never going to end his marriage to Jane because he doesn't want to risk um, questioning the legitimacy of his heir. And, you know, she probably would have had more sons. Jane would absolutely have been Edward's regent. It was entirely expected that the mother of a child king would be their regent. I mean, Henry had even toyed with making Catherine Parr Edward's regent because when she becomes his stepmother, she effectively becomes his mother. And Henry has an earlier will from before he went off to France in the 1540s where he named Catherine Parr as regent. But Jane, of course, she would definitely have become regent. So Edward Seymour, Thomas Seymour, they just wouldn't have had the rivalry, I think, that they have when Edward obviously gets all the spoils. He becomes Lord Protector. He becomes Governor of the King. Under Jane's rule, they're going to be really, really prominent individuals. Jane may well have pushed Thomas a bit more, given him more honours, more awards, but it would be Jane who's in charge. And I, I really can't see the two brothers being executed when Jane is regent. How different history would have been Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, obviously, we'd be talking about the three wives of Henry VIII, which doesn't have quite the same sort of drama attached to it. Yeah, we probably wouldn't have this podcast. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) I'm curious, Elizabeth, what is it about Jane Seymour that you appreciate the most? I think she's a really interesting figure. She's quite a sad figure. She gets quite a lot of bad press. Um, because of her role in the fall of Anne Boleyn. Obviously, Anne is very, very popular and really, really didn't deserve her death at all. I mean, I, you know, even real Anne haters, if you like, don't think that she deserved to be beheaded. I mean, even Eustace Chapuy didn't think that she deserved it. And, I mean, he really disliked her. So Jane gets a lot of hate from that. And I, my take on Jane very much is that actually she's quite similar to Anne Boleyn. Um, But I don't think, you know, I don't think we can pin the execution on her. So what I think is really interesting about Jane and what kind of draws me to her is she's such an enigma. And I just want to know more about her because she's a woman right there in the centre of events. And she she has enough about her that Henry is determined to marry her and actually, you know, beheads Anne Boleyn so that he can marry Jane. So I just want to know more about her. She's such an enigma. Okay, now for the last question, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. What do you believe was Jane's biggest contribution to English history other than Edward VI? Oh, that's a tricky one. I mean, she doesn't leave much historical mark. I always think I always think of Henry's wives as kind of the major and the minor wives. And Jane, along with Anne of Cleves and Catherine Howard, is very much in the minor wives category. I think her biggest contribution is perhaps that she very much reinforces the fact that actually a king doesn't need to marry a foreign princess, that you can promote an English woman as your queen. And obviously Henry had done that before with Anne Boleyn. His grandfather, Edward IV, had done it with Elizabeth Woodville. But in general, other than those, um, in fact, other than those two women, uh, there are no English queens of England um, post-conquest. Kings always marry foreign princesses. So I think Jane just really reinforces that you can get a queen from your own country, that you can promote a woman. And I think it's difficult to see that as, you know, sort of a feminist stance or, you know, even something that um, increases the prominence of women, because we're very much in a patriarchal society in Tudor England. I mean, undoubtedly so. But I think it just is just another factor in ideas that actually women potentially could be suitable to wield some power. So I think it's it's a little bit tentative, but I think actually Jane's role as an English queen who does well is perhaps laying the groundwork a little bit for the reigning queens that we get later in the century. So Mary and Elizabeth. So I think in that sense, you know, she is quite important. And we don't want to forget to remind our listeners that you were recently involved in the BBC series, The Boleyns. Congratulations. Thank you very much. No, it was so much fun to be take part in. Now, I don't want to be like, what do you have going on next? But I'm going to ask you anyway, what projects do you currently have going on that we can look forward to? 
Ah, so I've got a couple more filming projects going on, so I can give more details on Twitter later on about those. Um, I'm also in the very early stages of a new book, but I'm not supposed to say what it is just yet, but I'm very excited about that. Oh, you can tell us. Nobody's listening. <laughs> just... I, well, I know you're wrong there because I know that your podcast is incredibly popular. So everyone is listening. Oh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. And um, what I will do as well is I'll make sure to put in the show notes for this episode how people can find you and find your books and find your programs. So, Elizabeth, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you very much for having me. It's always such a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.